If you see me passing by And you sit and you wonder why And you wish that you were rambling too Nail your shoes to the kitchen floor Lace them up and bar the door Thank your stars for the roof that's over you And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Can't help but wonder where I'm Oh, there it is. All right. I'm live. Good afternoon, YouTube. The internet. Welcome to the internet. You may never leave. All right. Whoa. People are popping in like crazy. There was like nobody here. When I first came on, now we got loads of people. What's up? Patrick Wolf in Virginia. How's it going over there in Virginia? Dido's Red in Livermore, California. Good afternoon. Let's see. You guys hear me? You guys see me? My audio good? My video good? Let me make sure that you can see. I'm going to like position this little camera here. There we go. All right. Dolo Inc. What's up, Dolo Inc.? Dolo. I make, when I say Dolo, it makes me think of that YOLO. Remember YOLO? YOLO, brah. Oh, man, YOLO. How annoying was that? How annoying is pop culture in general? What a destructive force. How pernicious and destructive and disgusting is pop culture nowadays? Crazy. Artel Roomber. What's up, man? Adam Whitecraft. Patrick Wolf. Scrapperella. What's up, Scrapperella? That's a sick name. I like that. Zoran Verkic. That's a rad name. Janie Bug in Oregon. What's up? Dustin Mitchell. Sarah Bizur. What's up, everybody? Oh, man. Yeah, speaking of pop culture being disgusting. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to get into that. I was <laughs> I was listening to, to the late, great Johnny Cash just now. Isn't it amazing that... Johnny Cash, at the end of his career, like the twilight years of his life, put out some of his greatest material. I mean, it's To me, like Johnny Cash is the last albums he made, especially some of those duets he does with June in the end there. But like most of them, I think we're called like American recordings. And we got like, um, yeah, American recordings, American one through five or six or something. I think he did five of them or six of them. But man, he had some crazy songs in there. When the man comes around, stuff like that. Um, just and and none of those none of those tracks on those last albums are even his own songs. That's what I think is so cool about Johnny Cash. He kind of like you know, humbled himself at the end of his career and recorded albums of almost nothing but other people's songs. And he took those tracks, he took those songs, and he made them better than the original. Almost every single one. He did that one. What was that track? That song hurt from uh nine inch nails i mean the original was all right nothing special like you know deeply painful and moving song but when johnny cash sings that song it's just it when he sung that song it was just something different desperado you know i mean there's just there's so many tracks that he did when the man comes around there's so many tracks that he did that were just a hundred times better than the originals and i think it's so cool that he did that you know late in his life this dude had a prolific career very art you know, just such a high output. And um, I don't know, to me, it's just so cool to see somebody like doing cover songs better than the originals and giving them more meaning and putting more heart into it and more soul, more spirit into it than even the original artist did. Only Johnny Cash was able to do that. That was one of the few that, that held on to, uh, <laughs> one of the few in the music industry that was able to hold on to his soul. Great freaking stuff. Dustin Mitchell says, I like his version of Hurt. That's a good one, but there's other ones too, man. Like uh, The Man Comes Around with that that one piano note on that. I like that song. I like that track. What else? There's a bunch. Redemption. The Beast in Me. The Beast in Me. That's a great track. Yeah, man. Could almost feel the pain. Dustin, yeah, but all right, so Dustin says, Johnny Cash really put some emotion in it. Could almost feel the pain. You feel the pain, but then there's like this wisdom in there too, right? Like his, and Dustin says, you have that one note. <laughs> there's this wisdom in his voice and this like, it's not just pain and suffering of, of like, you know, the classic 
artist junkies pain and suffering where it's all self-inflicted where it's all you know self-indulgent suffering he he reached this kind of this wisdom in his old age and you can see it in the song selections you know he got like he had a very spiritual song selection in the in the end there um God's gonna cut you down, you know that song. Sooner or later, they're gonna cut you down. Freaking awesome! All right, <laughs> Sarah says, "Have you ever seen the Freddie Mercury guy, the dude that looks and sounds just like him?" No, I have not. Freaky. <laughs> All right, Scrapper says you could feel his soul was hurting when he sang "Hurt." I don't know about that. I feel I feel like he. When he sung that song, for him to be able to perform that, I feel like he had reached a certain amount of uh, he had reached a certain amount of of wisdom and experience where he was able to feel that, and he experienced that for so much in his life. And what I see there is this, this wiser old man who's who's beyond it, but who can still feel it, right? Because I mean, if you're entrapped, if you're trapped in that, it's kind of hard to to perform a, a piece like that, right? Like if you're actually in that amount of pain, good luck. <laughs> expressing it effectively or wanting to express anything. Chris Grammatica. What's up, Chris, with a picture of Frank Zappa? <laughs> Frank Zappa, Willie the Pimp. What's another? What's a good Frank Zappa song, Chris? What's your favorite? What's your favorite album? You like Hot Rats? Or is that a track? Is that a song? There's so many good Frank Zappa songs. Oh, man. What, what's that one Frank Zappa song that's a hilarious album? It's almost all... It's almost all joke songs. And as that song, it's like, he's so gay. He's so gay. It's, it's so funny. It's over the, or uh, Bobby Brown. Hey there, ladies, I'm Bobby Brown. <laughs> I won't sing the rest of it for the children. All right. Chris Grammaticus says, Billy the Mountain. <laughs> Willie the Pimp, Billy the Mountain. What's that one? There's that one. Is Hot Rats is an album, right? Hot Rats is a great Frank Zappa album. <laughs> Hot Rats is, is freaking awesome. That whole album's great. All right, let's answer some real questions. Let's stop talking about music. What's up, everybody? Central Illinois checking in. We got, man, we got people from all over. Welcome, everybody. All right, so if you've never joined me on one of these live hangouts, we talk about all kinds of stuff. We talk about nutrition. We talk about optimizing lifestyle. Shoot, meal timing, diet, intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet, living abroad, living in Ecuador, successful business strategies, all kinds of stuff we get into here. Um, the channel is called Primal Edge Health. I like the word primal. I don't know. It's like the essence of something. The, the primal essence of life. That's what we're about here. Expanding on that. Expanding on life. Expanding on what we're blessed with here. Uh, this moment we're in right now. So... I get to uh, sit here and, and babble, and you guys get to type your questions to me, and I get to answer them selectively, <laughs> and uh, or we can just have a nice conversation. So Jordan Bacardi says, hey, can you eat as many calories as you want and still lose weight on keto? Ooh, that question gets me heated. Okay, can you eat as many calories as you want and still lose weight on a ketogenic diet? No, <laughs> for most people, Jordan, the answer is going to be no. Now, there's a lot of caveats to this, and let me first explain why it is perceived that, you know, why some people seem to believe that you can eat indiscriminately, eat as much fat as you want, lose, lose weight on a ketogenic diet. So a ketogenic diet is a diet that is very low in carbohydrates that makes you burn fat for energy. When you're low in carbohydrates, your body begins to break down fatty acids. It creates ketone bodies from these, and ketone bodies can be used as energy in the brain, heart, and many of the vital organs, and throughout muscle, skeletal muscle tissue, which will also oxidize fatty acids for energy. But ketogenic diet simply means a diet that keeps you in ketosis to let you burn fat for fuel. Um, now, energy balance still matters. Energy balance matters no matter what diet you are on. It doesn't matter what diet you're on, energy balance matters. Meaning, if you eat a gallon of coconut oil in a day, do not expect to burn body fat. Now, here's what happens with a ketogenic diet and why people believe that you can eat as much as you want and lose weight. Well, <laughs> that's going to be confusing. That's because some people can eat as much as they want on a ketogenic diet and lose weight. But those people are naturally restricting calories 
They're naturally restricting how much food they eat because of the magic of keto. The magic of keto is not that it makes you allowed, it makes you able to eat as much as you want and you can't lose weight. It makes you want to eat less. So if we're going to play word games here, a ketogenic diet might make you want to eat less, meaning that threshold where your hunger is satisfied, where you're satiated, the threshold will be a little bit lower so you'll require less food to feel full. That allows you to lose body fat. Long-term, a ketogenic diet is incredibly effective at losing body fat, at maintaining lean muscle mass, um, and it allows you to consistently tap into your body fat and go for long periods of time without food. So... In the beginning of a ketogenic diet, some people might feel like, oh man, I'm not even hungry. I'm eating so much food. I can eat as much as my, I want. I'm still losing weight. This isn't because suddenly energy balance doesn't matter. The laws of physics go out the door when you get on a ketogenic diet. It doesn't matter. You can eat as much food as you want. And you won't gain weight as long as you're not eating carbs. Sorry, that's not how it works. What really happens is ketones are powerful signaling molecules. If your leptin is high enough, meaning if you're getting enough protein and fat, you're timing your meals correctly, you're going to be in a state of low hunger all the time. When you're eating carbs all the time, a lot of the times those carbs can spark hunger. They can make your blood sugar go up and down. They can be trigger foods for a lot of people where it's just like one bite is not enough. I mean, we all know that feeling when you have like one bite of a donut or something. Come on, it's on. Like one bite of ice cream, it's just not enough. <laughs> it's just you keep going. They're hyper palatable, nutrient dense, calorie dense foods, and uh, you want to avoid those. So you're going to eat nutrient dense foods, but foods that are sparking satiety. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you eat a bowl of cereal, you can eat five more before you, before you realize you're not hungry anymore. So protein is the most satiating macro. On a ketogenic diet, you make sure you're getting sufficient protein source, and that's what you manipulate long term. So protein stays relatively fixed. For most people, you're not going to need to change your protein intake much. As long as you're getting sufficient protein, you yeah, should be good. Sufficient protein for most people. I'll throw a, a number out there that will be safe for almost everybody. That doesn't mean this is the perfect level for everybody. It's all about individual context. So protein, most people will be good at about 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. Then fat is for energy. That's what you adjust long term. Now, instead of carbs being your energy source, you have fat as your energy source. So more fat on the plate, meaning if you eat more fat, you're giving yourself more energy. But that's not always good if you're trying to lose body fat. If you're trying to lose body fat, you want to tap into your body fat. So eating more fat on the plate won't make you burn more body fat. You can adjust that according to your goals. Carbohydrates stay fixed. Most people, 30 grams net carbs is a safe spot to start out. So there you go. <laughs> that was a really long answer, and I hope I helped you out, and I hope I saved you some time, confusion, and saved you from wasting a bunch of energy and wasting money on a bunch of crap you don't need, like blood ketone strips. Because first of all, well, not first of all, I don't know why I said first of all, but if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're doing it for fat loss and your goal is to lose body fat, pushing your ketones higher will not make you lose more body fat. Yes, ketones can be an indicator that you are in ketosis and that you're burning fat efficiently, but that can be dietary fat. Who cares if you're burning dietary fat? I can throw a client on you know, two tablespoons of MCT oil every hour, and if they test their blood ketones obsessively and waste loads of money on blood ketone strips that cost like five bucks a freaking piece, I can put them on that MCT oil and they'll have high ketones, but they're not going to be burning body fat. Higher blood ketones does not associate with, high, with more fat loss. So pick one, <laughs> either chasing those high ketones or you can be concerned with results. So thanks for the question. Jordan Bocardi, great question. Very, very popular question. Question that I'm answering all the time. Question that I've made lots of videos on. Um, so yeah, unlimited fat, unfortunately, that's not really how it works. For some people, it might feel that way though because their hunger grows so low. So if you're just starting out a ketogenic diet, you got to make sure you're dialing in your macros. You got to make sure you're getting your micronutrients in line and your electrolytes in line, which I talk about all the time. But also, it's good to understand what you're doing in your kitchen. You got to have you you've got to have a solid foundation of staple foods that you can go to that you can make in a pinch on the fly. And that's one of the most important things is building that habit, changing those 
go-to meals that we have when we don't have time to think about food or anything, if we're stressed out, if you've got to go to work, if you've got to bring the kids to school, if you've got to do this or that or the other, and you don't have time, you've got to have a solid foundation of staple keto-friendly go-to meals that you can get. And what's cool about a ketogenic diet is you can eat out most anywhere on keto. You can always get like a burger without a bun. You can always order a protein source and have some fats and a salad and some greens and be good and move on. So, you know, have have that foundation, build that foundation. It's about rearranging habits. Long-term fat loss is about habit formation. It's not about just, oh, you do this diet, you restrict your calories here and there. No, we have to make new habits that we can bring forward with us and use as a foundation for the rest of our life. Your body is built of the habits your body is built of your daily habits. So you change those daily habits in order to change your body. Whoa, profound, crazy, right? <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Felipe Andrade. ¿Qué pasó? He says, hey, Tris, mate, when's the best time to eat after a workout while in keto to grow muscles and lose more weight? Felipe Andrade. To grow muscles, to lose more weight, Hard to reconcile the two sometimes. Unless your macros are dialed in, you've been doing it for a long time. The best time to eat after a workout. There's no real magic anabolic window after a workout. So this is going to depend on context, right? It's going to depend on the context of what your daily schedule looks like. It's going to depend on the context of how many calories you need to get in per day, how much protein you need to get in per day. You know, Can you get that protein in, in two meals? Can you get it in one meal? Do you want to get it in one meal? If you're trying to grow muscle, getting it in in one meal or two meals might not be ideal if the goal is to burn, burn body fat. Then restricted meal timing window, restricted eating windows, messing with the meal timing can be really important. You're talking about gaining muscle and losing body fat at the same time. It can be done. It can be done effectively. It can be done on a ketogenic diet. But you got to dial in those macros. Um, macros will be more important than meal timing. Intensity of your workouts, your ability to recover, all that stuff will be affected more by the total nutrient intake throughout the day rather than the nutrient timing. Meal timing is one of the least important things for building muscle and burning fat, but it's still kind of important. Uh, you know, Eating late at night will make it more difficult to burn fat. Eating late at night will make it more difficult to sleep, which will make it more difficult to create the hormones you need to repair your body, and it'll throw off your circadian rhythm. So the best time to eat a meal, depending on when you work out, if you're trying to grow muscle, strictly if you're just trying to grow muscle, the best time to eat a meal, you're going to want to eat a meal before that workout. You're going to want to eat after. But you're going to want to make sure you're not eating too many calories that you're getting fat. <laughs> uh, if you're trying to lose body fat and gain muscle at the same time, I'd say the best thing to do is come up with a macro strategy that's getting you sufficient protein, sufficient fats to fuel those workouts, and... Make sure that you're getting a meal within 24 hours of the workout, and you should be fine. I mean, super advanced lifters can benefit from like really tweaking the meal timing, but in that situation, for you, I'd say just make sure your macros are on point. Try to get a meal in within 24 hours, and you're going to spark that muscle protein synthesis, and you'll be good. So thanks for the question. Um, if Look, if you're trying to dial this in further and really refine it, I would say do a little bit more research on meal timing, look at some of the studies on PubMed about meal timing, about the circadian rhythm, or work with somebody who's good at formulating plans and helping you with stuff like that. Um, so yeah, thanks for the question. Let's move on. Chris Gramatica, hey boss, how you end up in the Andes? Somebody asks that almost every time. How did I end up in the Andes? I do not know. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up here. How did I, how did I end up anywhere? I, I don't know, man. How'd I, end I ended up in the Andes. We came here in 2010. Take some of this stuff. Okay. All right. What I just took there, uh, my brother actually came to Ecuador, and he brought me some organic CBD hemp oil. Oh, you guys see that? I can't really see it. Anyways, yeah. Cool stuff. Anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's non-psychoactive, so it's not like you know, smoke cannabis or something. You smoke weed and you get really stoned. 
CBD is actually very potent anti-inflammatory. It's got all kinds of incredible uh, mechanisms that are just being studied now. And of course, the FDA and the USDA and the DEA are um, rapidly and criminally trying to restrict the sale and uh, and the expansion of that market. So that's going to be interesting to see what goes on with all that. Um, yeah. That's funny. People, people think that they can tell other people what they can put in their bodies. Isn't that freaking crazy? Hey, boss, how you end up in the Andes? Chris, I don't know, man. I could give you a thousand different answers and a thousand different moments for that. I'll say right now that it's just, it's all part of the adventure, man. Like this is, we, we came here in 2010. It was a trip. It was a journey and it still is and it's still expanding. It's still growing. Um, we've got two kids born here in Ecuador in the Andes and we love it. We like it here. We dig it. We're here for now. Don't know why, don't know how. Don't know how long. <laughs> Shoot, I don't know if I'll wake up tomorrow. Dustin Mitchell, what's up? Repent people, how's it going? Repent people says, I am still hungry on keto and don't have a lot of energy. Is this normal? All right, good question. You're still hungry on keto and you don't have a lot of energy. Sounds like something's off. You know, I mean, it's, look, you're still hungry and you got a lot of energy. If you were a client, We'd start getting in the circadian rhythm. What time are you going to bed? I mean, are you a shift worker? What time are you eating your meals? How many grams of protein, fat, and carbohydrates are you eating? These things, we'd look at all of these things and we'd start assessing. So I'd say likely what's going on in your situation, the most likely culprit across the board is electrolyte depletion, meaning people are not getting enough sodium, magnesium, and potassium. Sodium is very easy. Make sure you're getting in, I mean, for most people, like seven grams, five to seven grams of sodium per day. You can get that from an unrefined sea salt. Uh, some people like Himalayan salt and stuff like that. Um, my friend's sending me links to used cars here. He sent me a 79 Impala. Like that would That's so useless to me here. Yanu, why would I want a 79 Impala? It's, I'm sure it's beautiful. But why? That'd be fun though, on some of these roads. The ro All right, so here, that was a total crazy tangent. The roads in Ecuador are terrible. I wouldn't want any car that wasn't like significantly high off the ground for clearance and uh, I didn't have four-wheel drive. That's just me. I like I like the option to be able to, to get off of the roads too. And an Impala is not going to give you that, Yanu. All right. So back to the original question. From repent people, you're still hungry. I'd say your electrolytes are probably off. Check your electrolytes. Make sure you're getting enough protein. Make sure you're getting enough fat for energy. And if your goal is fat loss, then you dial back that fat a little bit when you're comfortable and when you're ready. You don't want to stress your, yourself out too much. But what also could be going on is a ketogenic diet could be throwing you into a higher stress scenario than you're able to deal with and you're just drained. You could have all, you could have some, I don't know, there's a lot of things that could be going on there. You could have a circadian rhythm mismatch, like you know, if you're not if you're working night shifts, you're sleeping all day, you're not exposed to the sun. You could have environmental crap going on. You could have emotional, uh, psychological stress happening, and that's blocking you from energy production. Everybody likes to focus just on diet, like oh, you know, I'm doing a ketogenic diet, and I'm still hungry, and I don't have energy. Um, I mean, these are these are normal things to feel hunger. And if you're stressed out, if you're living a life that you're not satisfied with, if you're working a job you don't like, if you're waking up every day and you're in a relationship that's unhealthy, if you're in many unhealthy relationships, with most, which most people are, these are constant stressors on us. And then trying to pull glucose out of the diet and reformat how you burn fuel and burn fat as fuel for energy, that can push you over the edge and your body's just like, ah, oh, I'm too stressed. So hey, I'll be the first one to tell you a ketogenic diet might not be for everybody. Um, I hope that helps repent people. First, check the electrolytes. Make sure you're getting enough protein and not too little protein because that's a really common thing is people think they need to restrict protein to such an extreme degree. Um, get enough protein in. Like we talked about earlier, 0.8 grams per pound of your lean body mass is a great safe spot, more than enough for 90% of the population. And um, and you'll be all right. Yo, LC Hutchinson in England. What's up, Yo, LC? Whoa, look at that name. All right, somebody from uh from the Eastern Block. 
with a name I can't pronounce or read, says, what is the reason behind heart palpitations at night? Heart palpitations at night is an electrolyte imbalance. If your heart is palpitating at night, one of the first things I would do is increase your potassium intake. Tr try eating an avocado if it starts to happen and see if it goes down. That would probably indicate that it's a potassium deficiency. Uh, potassium can Low potassium can give you heart palpitations, low sodium, low magnesium. Those three things, sodium, magnesium, and potassium, are kind of like the trifecta of electrolytes that you need to be concerned with when you're doing a ketogenic diet. So make sure you get enough salt. Get some magnesium in. I usually recommend supplementing some magnesium because most of our food supply has been stripped of a lot of its vital nutrients. Um, most people are magnesium deficient. So I would say get some magnesium glycinate. Take that. Increase your potassium intake. Increase your sodium intake. And the heart palpitation thing that's going on as you're adapting should stop. Scraparella says too much caffeine. Well, that's, come on. I mean, if this person's pounding five glasses of caffeine or of coffee and laying down to sleep and their heart's palpitating, I think they'd make that connection, Scraparella. But maybe not. Maybe you're right. Chuck Connor says, down 21 pounds in five weeks. Your modified keto and IF. That's so cool. Chuck Connor. Congratulations, man. 21 pounds in five weeks. That's so cool. That's like that's four pounds a week. That is fantastic. And I didn't look, man. You say your modified keto and IF. I didn't like invent ketogenic diet. I didn't invent intermittent fasting. I just look at the research. I test on myself. I test on hundreds of clients. And I found certain formulas that seem to stack up with each other and seem to work really well. Um when you say modified IF, I'm guessing you're talking about the way that I like to teach intermittent fasting for people um, who want to do intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting being a restricted eating window that allows you to, if you're on a carbohydrate-based diet, it allows you to burn fat to kind of be on the outskirts of ketosis for a significant amount of time um, through that fasting. But if you're on a ketogenic diet, Kind of just allows you that smaller eating window, lets you eat less. It's harder to get in a lot of calories in just a small eating window. And the meal timing can make a huge difference in how much hunger you have throughout the day. So usually when I'm teaching intermittent fasting, or if I'm working with clients, instead of having them push breakfast back to as long as they can, which can be problematic for a lot of people due to circadian rhythm issues, leptin signaling, cortisol, all that, can be thrown off by those morning fasts. What I like to do is have clients eat in the morning and have a second meal either in the afternoon. So if you eat like, if you want to do a four hour window, you eat at, I don't know, you can eat at like 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. or 7 a.m. and 12 p.m., which would be like a five hour eating window, very restricted eating window for very aggressive fat loss. You know, people who've got a lot of body fat to burn, that might be applicable. Um, but I like to have them eat earlier in the day rather than pushing breakfast back. So an eight-hour eating window might look like 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Rather than the standard like, oh, I started eating at 1 p.m. and I'm done eating at 9 p.m. That can throw the circadian rhythm off quite a bit. Uh, breakfast is very, very important for the circadian rhythm, for blood glucose control. They've done studies in people who ate later in the day lost less body fat on an isocaloric diet than people who eat early in the day. Very, very interesting. So that's how I talk about intermittent fasting. All right. Dolo Inc. says, just had my one-year update on keto, down plus 120 pounds, and reversed a bunch of ailments, most importantly, diabetes. Through diet alone without any medication, you played an important role in my success. Wow. Dolo Inc., I recognize that name. You always come to these hangouts, don't you? I'm honored. Um... Uh, you say I play an important role. Look, man, I'm just relaying the message. I'm just kind of out here blabbering, telling people how to do it. Um, we like to put out as much content as we can for free and try and help people out and try and inspire people with this project. Um, we love doing this. I love working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, but I also like doing these hangouts and just trying to blast out as much relevant information and help as many people as I can. So um, yeah, Dolo Inc., keep tuning in. Thank you. If you really like this the uh, channel and you want to support the work that we do and yeah if you want to support this work go to primaledgehealth.com 
Um, my wife's cookbook, the ketogenic edge cookbook is available exclusively there. Um, now I talked about building a solid foundation earlier of uh, go to keto meals that fit your macros that you can make in a pinch that is nutrient dense, good, healthy foods that you can always eat. So instead of reaching for the, you're reaching for the pop tarts when you're in a pinch or getting a bag of chips, you go for something healthy. You keep your fridge stocked. You make a big bulk batch of meatballs. And you keep your fridge stocked with that. You can pull it out at any time. There's just little strategies like this. The Ketogenic Edge Cookbook can really help you to build a foundation of good, nutrient-dense, fat loss friendly macro keto meals. Uh, the entire book, every single recipe has macros. All the recipes, in all the recipes, she even shows you how to like modify them for more carbohydrate based diets. So if you've got people in your family who got kids like we do, um, she kind of gives suggestions in all the recipes or most of the recipes on how you can make it more kid friendly. Uh, you know, add a side of sweet potatoes for the kids, stuff like that. It's really thoughtful. The way that she laid this thing out, she spent over a year and a half on it and it really shows. So if you want to support the channel, if you like the work we do here, check out the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, a training manual for low carb, ketogenic, and paleo cuisine. And that's available exclusively at primaledgehealth.com. It's not on Amazon. It's not anywhere else. It's self published. It's available in ebook format on primaledgehealth.com. Check it out. And uh, yeah, Dolomit, thanks, man. Thanks for the shout out. I'm glad that, you know, that you think we, uh, we were able to help you through this and uh, keep it up, man. Just keep going. Cat C, what's up, Cat? Dustin Mitchell, what's up, man? Ryan Backus says, opinion on Palumbo diet or high-protein, moderate-fat, no-carb keto diet for bodybuilding. I'm not familiar with the Palumbo diet, but you're saying high-protein, moderate-fat, no-carb. I mean, these are words, right? High, moderate. I mean, no is pretty simple. You don't need any carbs. No-carb. Yeah, I don't know, man. I I'd have to look at that diet. This is, I mean... Just the words sound kind of weird, like high protein, no carbs, like no vegetables at all. I don't know. <clears throat> Paradoxical axiom. What's up, man? So many questions today. Tristan, have you ever considered making a FAQ YouTube playlist that you can refer people to so you aren't always answering repeat questions? Are you my wife? Like, this is, this is crazy. Jessica had the same idea so many times. I'm just like, yeah, I'll do that someday. Um <laughs> All right. Ryan Backus says, Elite says, would you be happy to send me a copy of your wife's book for me to review? No, I'm not going to send you a free copy of my wife's book. Would you be happy to send me something for free so I can say that I'll review it? <laughs> Paradoxical Axiom says, buy it, you stinge. <laughs> Look, if you want the cookbook, go buy the cookbook. I'm going to send it out to you for free. Because you said you'll review it on a YouTube comment. We got loads of reviews on the website. I want to first of all say thank you also to all the people who have left reviews on the website for the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook. Freaking awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time out of the day to actually do that. I know it takes time. It takes energy. I appreciate it. All right. Elite's getting, getting pissy. You're out of here, buddy. Remove. Block. You're out of here. These people come out here and get pissy, right? Start crying about stuff, fighting in the comments. Like, what's what is your deal? You get, who gets who gets on the internet and goes and fights with people on YouTube comments for fun? Like, get a freaking hobby, buddy. All right, Ryan Backus says like 1.5 grams of protein per pound body weight, 0.5 to 0.75 gram fat per pound, and veggies sub 30 to 40 net carbs. So 1.5 grams protein per pound body weight. For a bodybuilding diet, that could be real. That could be very effective for a pure muscle mass building diet with minimal fat gain. The macros you just said, so 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 grams, 0 0.75 grams of fat per pound. So for me, if I'm like 150 right now, or 155 between 150 and 155 right now, um, that'd be like per pound of body weight. It'd be like 200 grams of protein, which would be hard for me to eat. I wouldn't like to eat that much protein, but I could do it. That would also be for me like, I don't know, 100 grams of fat or 125 grams of fat, which is not that hard to stay that low. And then vegetables. I think that could be a very anabolic diet. I think that could be really effective. Hey, it's like Palumbo, right? That was a former bodybuilder, so he, he knows what he's doing. Um, 
sounds like it could be effective. That's not the way that I would teach people to do a ketogenic diet. Um, but of course, you know, like my clientele are not bodybuilders. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not working. I work with people who work out. I work with people who are jacked. But I'm not talking about like – you're talking about bodybuilders. You're talking about like extreme, you know, with a little help from your friends in your veins, uh, like really intense stuff there. So yeah, I mean I think it could work, right? All right, Robert S., what's up, man? Rizwan Khan, how's it going, man? Rizwan Khan says, where'd you go? I'm doing it for weight loss. Does skipping a meal help? I skip lunch sometimes, and I stay energized still. I do it for a caloric deficit. Good idea if energy remains good. If you're going for fat loss. <laughs> if you're going for fat loss and your hunger is low, and you don't feel like eating, and you can skip meals, it might be a dang good idea to be skipping some of those meals. You're burning more body fat in between. Now, here's what I'll say. Make sure you're getting in your protein intake. Make sure you're getting in sufficient protein to maintain lean muscle mass. Don't just start starving yourself of macros all, you know, all the time. Get the protein in. Skipping meals now and then, great strategy. If you're going for long-term fat loss and you can skip meals, there you go. You're doing well. And that's the magic of keto for a lot of people. It makes it so they can skip those meals. It makes it so they can eat less. It makes it easier to eat less. It doesn't make it so you can eat as much as you want and lose weight. Like you just make a bunch of keto cupcakes. It's munch on keto cupcakes all day and think you're going to lose body fat. That's not how it works, unfortunately. But you're on the right track, Wiz Rizwan Khan. And I love your name, man. Like you, it, just, it sounds it's like a Batman villain name. It's so rad, Rizwan Khan. Rizwan Khan. Yeah. It just makes me think of like, I had this, all right, never mind. I'm not going to get into it. No tangents. No tangents, Tristan. Bad Tristan. All right. Elio Hallow, thoughts on fasting for more than 48 hours? Context, my friend. It's about context. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing dangerous about it. If done right, it's done for the right reasons. I think long-term fasting should be taken very seriously, more seriously than people are advertising it. I think long-term fasting can be dangerous, especially the refeeding stage. But 48 hours isn't really long-term. Uh, Chill Topher, what's up, man? Chill Topher says, does consuming up to two tablespoons of coconut oil during a fasting period of the day encourage the body to burn fat or slow ketosis because you'll burn dietary versus body fat? Good question. All right, so you're fasting. You haven't eaten for, you know, 16 hours or something. You know, you're doing an intermittent fasting. You're trying to lose body fat for whatever reason. I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm just saying what if you are? Answer the question here. Two tablespoons of coconut oil during the fasting period of the day. There's absolutely no point to doing that. If you're trying to fast, why are you going to eat two tablespoons of coconut oil? It's not going to make you burn more body fat. It's going to make you you'll burn that coconut oil. I don't know exactly. I mean, in every single situation across the board, it's impossible to say exactly metabolically what is going to happen every cell of your body when this coconut oil goes down there. But I will tell you this. You're putting energy in that you're going to need to burn. If the goal is to burn body fat for energy, you're not going to be able to accomplish that goal by putting two tablespoons of coconut oil in, and it's not a fast. A fast is when you don't eat, not when you just eat fat or if you just eat eggs or if you just eat butter. Or you just eat bone broth. None of those are fasting, especially bone broth. Very insulinogenic. Ugh, crazy, right? Crazy, crazy. Christopher McAdam, what's up, man? Says, hi, Tristan. Hope all is well. Thank you very much. All, well, right here, all is well. Right here, right now, all is well. Darius says, do you do prolonged fasts like 72 hours? Uh, not not for like body composition purposes or even for health. I mean, for, I guess for health purposes, if I were to do a 72-hour fast, which I have done, I've done much longer. Uh, let me get into that. What I think fasting is very, very powerful for. Duke, come here. Hey. Come inside. Daisy. Oh, I'm here. I'm on. Four-legged killers. Um, fasting can be very, very powerful for spiritual growth. It can be very powerful for getting through, you know, 
emotional, psychological, and spiritual barriers. Uh, it's been used in every single spiritual tradition from time immemorial. Every spiritual tr tradition on the planet uses some form of fasting uh, to for spiritual attainment, for insight, for revelation. So I think that fasting can be powerful for that, for connecting with the truth, for pulling down barriers that are you know blocking you from perceiving things that you need to be perceiving in order to grow as a person. I think fasting can be super powerful for that. What I think is really obnoxious is like, hey, like fast yourself sexy. Like, you know, I mean, you got like obese people telling you to fast for fat loss, <laughs> right? Like this is crazy. This is freaking insane to me. Like obese, overweight people with eating disorders telling people how to get healthy through starving themselves. That's what I don't like. Now, fasting can be very powerful, but I'm not into this whole, I don't know, I'm, I'm torn. Like, I think it can be so powerful for many people. But just like any tool, if it's used in the wrong way, it can be dangerous or it can just neutralize the power of that tool. So I think fasting is kind of being, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's getting pop culturified right now. People are getting that fast in money. <laughs> so whatever. Adam Franz. Adam Franz. What's up, man? Says, are you going to get more maca? I'm going to get more maca for me. <laughs> All right. So we were selling maca for many months. It's out. There's none left. We were selling it at a ridiculously low price for the best maca that you're ever going to find. Well, not ever going to find, but the best maca available. It's not like it was this one batch that was better than everything else. No, it's just the quality stuff, which is very, very scant in the market because most people water their crap down with crap that you don't want to be eating. All right. So, uh, yeah, we're, maca, we'll have – we should have more maca eventually. I don't know when. I don't know how much. It's not going to be – like insanely priced like it was before. I mean, we were selling one kilo for what people sell one pound for. We, sh we won't be able to do that again. Uh, but we'll have more maca. Sorry to everybody who wants some. We don't have it. Um, we'll get more. The only thing we've got available and we do have available in abundance is the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, and that's available at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. So the training manual for low-carb, ketogenic, and paleo cuisine. We, we call it a training manual. I say this every time I talk about it because it's freaking true. We call it a training manual because it's much more than just a cookbook. It's not just a list of recipes. This is a manual for getting down and dirty in your keto kitchen, for really rearranging your kitchen. There's an entire section even on how to use spices. So we kind of we made this book as the book we would have wanted when we started keto. The book we would have wanted if we were like 21 years old, barely knew how to prepare food for ourselves. Like this is it's the recipes are not crazy. We're not doing like keto creme brulee when you have to like use a torch or something like that. We're not doing anything crazy like that. Most of the recipes, all of the recipes are fat loss friendly macros. None of them are using crazy esoteric ingredients. None of them are using a bunch of artificial sweeteners and junk food, stuff like that. This is straight up nose hold, no holds barred, good nutrient dense keto foods. No frills. It's a training manual teaching you how to make keto meals, how to formulate ketogenic meals and do it deliciously and consistently. So check out the book, PrimalEdgeHealth.com. It's available exclusively there. It's not on Amazon. It's not anywhere else. That's the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, a training manual for low-carb paleo and keto cuisine. Or low-carb keto and paleo cuisine. Should have looked at the teleprompter there. Tiz Kaya says, uh, wait, wait, where'd it go? Ah! I lost everybody. All right, I'm going to pull this. I got to do pop out chat so I can see all the questions and stuff. I might have, oh man, a lot of them might go. All right, here we go. Where we got? We got here. Um, boop, 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 boop. So many people watching. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to be notified beforehand when I do these little live hangouts and stuff like that, um, go to PrimalEdgeHealth.com, the website, PrimalEdgeHealth.com. And uh, you can sign up for, we've got, uh, we have a sidebar, and I think it's on the right-hand side. You can sign up for updates, and we'll send you an email update before we do these live events so that you can ask your questions and stuff. If you're listening to this later on, uh, you might be frustrated that you can't type your questions or type your comment or whatever. If you want to tune in, if you want to hang out, if you want to interact live, 
just sign up for the newsletter. We'll do our best to get you a notice beforehand so that you can join these. Tiz says, ever consider doing a collab video with Jason Whitrock? You two are my fav my main YouTube sources. Um, Jason Whitrock is like this bodybuilder guy. I mentioned him in a video before, and he like left angry comments on my video. He wasn't happy with what I had to say about his uh, about some nonsense he was talking about. So I don't know, whatever. Um, probably not going to collaborate with him anytime soon. Not really. Yeah. Nothing personal. I was just like, not really interested. Not my cup of tea. I'm not interested in bodybuilding. I'm not interested in bodybuilding.com. And um, yeah, the guy just came all aggressive at me in some comment. It was pretty douchey. But whatever. Maybe he was having a bad day. I'm sure I'd get along with him if I met him in person. Maybe he's a nice guy, blah, blah, blah. Everything nice I'm supposed to say. Hello from Corpus Christi, Susan Price. What's up, Susan? Um, Seema Ruby says, how many grams of fat from food, from food should one eat if you need to lose body fat? How many grams of fat from food should one eat if you need to lose body fat? It's going to be different for somebody who weighs 60 kilos and somebody who weighs 120 kilos. It's going to be different if you're a woman, if you're a man. It's going to be different if you're in resistance training. It's going to be different if you're on steroids. If you're different, if you're, and there's, there's so many different factors that affect your metabolic rate. So you got to figure out where your metabolism's at. Um, how many f grams of fat should I eat if I want to lose body fat? Less than you need. <laughs> so you got to look at everything. I'm sorry that's not like you want an answer. You want me to tell you, eat this many grams of fat and you lose fat. Hey, look, if you eat zero grams of body fat, you know, or you zero grams of fat, you know you'll burn a lot of body fat. But that ain't sustainable or healthy long term. Um, yeah. Oh, I'll stop clicking my pen. Sorry, guys. I didn't realize there's a thing right here and I'm clicking making annoying sounds. Um, paradoxical axiom. Says, I know you're not a fan of pork and love fish. Can you rate your preferred meats and explain why you choose one over another? Also, ever have clients use topical magnesium oil as a supplement? Thanks. Paradoxical axiom, thank you for the comment and the question. Um, all right. My favorite, my preferred meats in order. I mean, it's like this is going to change every day, man. My preferences change all the time. Like that's something I learned as a little kid. It's like you don't, don't pick favorites. I don't have a favorite color. I don't have a – I got a favorite woman. That's my wife. I don't know. All right, so preferred meats right now. The preferred meats that I have available to me like in my house, I'll, I'll list that. First is going to be lamb. I've got this really, really good grass-fed, free-range, whatever, you know, really high-quality Andean-raised uh, lamb, ground lamb. Carne molida borrego. Uh, so I really like lamb. Also, I love fish and seafood. So I'll say like first would be like lamb, then you know salmon maybe. I like sardines. Fresh sardines really really good. Uh, corvina and swordfish. <laughs> corvina is sea bass. Sorry, that's uh, in Espanol. That's corvina. Well, aquí en Ecuador es corvina. Um, ooh, mosquito. Damn it, missed. Um, yeah, so I don't know, right, right there. So lamb, then like, you know, fish, then like beef. After that, duck. I like duck more than chicken. I like chicken more than turkey. And I don't really like much less than turkey. <laughs> so that'll tell you where I, what I think about chicken. I don't know, chicken not that great. Chicken tastes cheap to me. And I, it can be done right. It can be good. Like a good roasted bird can be really good. Turkey, not a flip, not a fan of. Too dry and all the tryptophan, just like rawr, you feel crappy afterwards. I like how I feel after I eat fish. I like how I feel with the selenium, the iodine, the DHA. I like how I feel after grass-fed lamb meat. Um, you know, sheep and mutton and lamb have a very favorable fatty acid profile, and I really like it. And I love the taste. Um, and grass-fed beef always tastes good. <laughs> Robert says, fish, beer, or chicken? Go oh, fish, and then beer, and then chicken. You, that's the correct order. <laughs> All right. Rizwan Khan says, eggs in the morning and fish, beer, or chicken for dinner? <laughs> what? what are you talking about? All right. Sarah says, 
Can you do a video of a tour of your town and show us where you get your food and what you buy? That could be cool. All right, I try not to blow up. I try not to talk about where I live that much, Sarah. Like I'll, I usually, I'll say, yeah, I live in the Andes. We live in Ecuador. But in case you haven't noticed, I don't really market my town. You know why? Because I don't want all you weirdos coming here. We got enough weirdos here already. Look at me. Like, come on. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll do some more like around town videos and stuff like that. I'm trying to blow this place up. I don't like advertising this place. That sounds like sounds kind of lame, right? Like that locals only mentality. I guess I'm like that though. I don't know. Tight knit circles. Robert says, I just read anything over 0 0.8 grams of pro 0.85 grams of protein per pound of body weight is superfluous based on tons of old studies. All right. 0.85 grams of protein per pound of lean body weight is sufficient for athletes, for people trying to gain muscle. And more than that, from what I've seen in the research, it seems like any more than that is kind of superfluous. You are right. Um, but, I mean, this could just be a lens of analysis type issue. I'm sure there's other people in the protein supplement industry who would tell you how important it is that you eat so much more protein than that. Um, so yeah, I mean, people who are selling whey protein powders and crap like that, bodybuilding.com, um, they might analyze those studies a little differently. But one of the articles I like was uh, from a guy that I had on the channel. He's a fitness coach, uh, physique coach, all embroiled in the mad, mad, sick world of fitness competitors and the fitness industry. But Menno is a great dude. Menno Henselmans came out a couple times, and he's got an article on Optimal protein intake. If you just look up Menno protein, uh, Menno protein, uh, you should come up. M E N N O is his name, and uh, yeah, he's got a great article. It breaks down the uh, it actually lists and cites the studies, which is very important. Whenever you're hearing, you know, somebody try to make claims like this and like nail down a specific ratio or numbers or something like that, look at the studies, read the studies. Uh, but he's got an article where he links to a lot of the abstracts of the studies and stuff like that. Very well done. I like it. Check out Menno's article on protein intake. I think his website is BayesianBodybuilding.com. B-A-Y-E-S-I-A-N. Great dude. Fun to talk to. Menno. Maybe I should have Menno on again. All right. Sarah Mazur says, all right, this is interesting. She says, I know you don't promote calorie counting, but do you have a minimum of calories or grams of protein that someone should get? I was just talking about this protein thing, and I, talked, I said several times that a good safe spot is 0.8 grams per pound of your lean body mass. Lean body mass. It's a good safe place, not way too much, definitely not too little. Um, so yeah, you say you don't promote calorie counting. When did I ever say I don't promote calorie counting? I don't look at, I don't formulate diets and think, okay, this person needs to be on 1200 calories diet. I look at it in terms of macros, which is simply a more precise way of measuring energy input. Macros, protein, fat, and carbs allow you to count calories and measure them more accurately because not all macros are created equal. Not all calories are created equal. All right, all right, all right, all right. Daniel, what's up, Daniel? All right, wait, hold on. We got a conversation going on here. I'm pulling up. Susan Price says, I had the opportunity to see a South American condor when I was a child in Brazil. I like how you hang bananas to ripen, picking them fresh. Awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Those condors are incredible, aren't they? They just like, they just like kick it with their all with their wings all up. It's so crazy. Um, really cool. Flytrap in New Zealand. What's up, Flytrap? Is it the middle of the night there? <laughs> Julie Morris says, Love, love, love your channel. And I thank you for your cookbook, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. It's really awesome, right? Um, Gaines 365. Gaines, what's up? Gaines 365. What's up, Tristan? Is it realistic to get down to a single digit body fat on keto while doing intermittent fasting? Yeah, you can do it. Is it healthy for you? 
Is this sustainable for you? Those are the questions. But yeah, you could definitely do it. Uh, D Doze Red says, you know if you'll have maca powder back in stock with the new season? If so, when? I'm rationing mine. I'm sorry. I'm not sure when will happen in, but soon. I will make the announcement. I'm not going to give an estimate even because I don't want to upset anybody if I don't come through, which I will do. I will come through, but it's all about timing, right? Okay. <laughs> Robert says, what's the most maca you've taken at one time? Ooh. I don't know. Well, okay. All right, so maybe like six years ago, there was a time. There was a time when I was eating a lot of maca. And what I was doing is I would take raw chocolate, raw cacao paste, uh, which is basically the beads pressed and ground up, stone ground. It's 100% cacao chocolate, so no sweet or nothing. 100% cacao chocolate. And I would take like a tablespoon of maca and I'd put it on top of it. Just maca powder. Like it sounds disgusting, but it tasted so good. It was like about simplicity sometimes. Like I like to fuel myself with the most nutrient. I, I, I don't know. I, I like foods that make me feel good. And maca and cacao together, whew, And I, I was doing like tablespoons at a time of maca and eating the cacao and Maybe, I don't know, shoot, I've probably taken five to ten tablespoons of maca at a time. Uh, it is a food. Remember, it's a food in the Andes. Yes, it's an adaptogen, but it's not a drug. It's not like a like an or it's not like certain herbs or if you take a whole bunch of it, you're gonna feel terrible. It's a food. I mean, the people bake they bake cakes with it, they bake bread with it, they make liquor out of it. Um, yeah, it's yeah, I don't know. I'd say like maybe five tablespoons at a sitting. My five to ten tablespoons uh, I've taken at a time with no ill effects. I was probably like, I probably felt really good that day. Or maybe it made me sleep. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what happened? High doses of maca can be interesting. can also just make you sleep. All right, all right. How does stress affect your results on a keto diet? Doreen, that is a fantastic question. Thank you. Stress affects everything negatively on whatever diet you're on. If you are stressed out, there's so many physiological things that happen when you're stressed out. First of all, it can make your cortisol rise and make your testosterone tank. Stress can make you tense up and energy flow in your body is restricted. So you're not getting endocrine flow. Your endocrine system is not functioning correctly when you're under stress. Therefore, you're not able to have a proper circadian rhythm for your hormones, and that can make it more difficult to lose body fat. Stress is a killer, not just a killer of people, but a killer of results on diets. So you got to reduce your stress. Now, if you're in a caloric deficit and you're stressed out, will you still lose body fat? In most cases, yeah. In some cases, it can offset the metabolism, make some funky things happen. Uh, but what happens when you're stressed out, it makes fat loss unsustainable. If you're stressed out and diet becomes an extra stressor, it makes it so much more likely that you're going to throw all that crap out the window and you're going to stop doing the diet. So, yeah. Stress. Stress management should be one of the major fronts that you're attacking if you're trying to make body composition changes. Um, yeah. Reduce the stress, whether the stress is psychological, physiological, mental, and emotional. All of these things can make us more inflamed, can make us not sleep as well, which makes us more inflamed. It can create all these negative feedback loops that throw off our hormones and make it hard to be healthy, to be vibrant, to be effective and to live life and enjoy life. So yeah, reduce stress. Just get rid of the stress. Just throw it away. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? All right. Balaz says, I can eat around 50 grams carb meal for breaking my fast and return to ketosis three to four hours later. How is it possible? I eat full keto the rest of the day. I feel good, but is this healthy? All right. There's a lot of assumptions in that statement. All right, so you say you're eating under 50 grams of carbs a meal when you break your fast or around 50 grams of carbs a meal. You're eating 50 grams of carbs in a meal. You're still in ketosis a few hours later when you check your blood glucose, your blood ketones rather, 
uh, and you're surprised. Is this healthy? I'm going to flip the script on you, man. Let me ask you this. Is it healthy to be obsessing over blood ketone numbers and pricking yourself and spending $5 on a blood ketone test strip every single meal you eat? Is that healthy? Is it a healthy habit to be obsessing over the number, to be bleeding yourself out every meal you have so that you can see if you're successful through this number on a blood glucometer, which really doesn't matter, or tell you if you're burning more fat, or tell you if you're healthier, happier, more effective, more productive in your life? Ooh, it was a long-ass run-on sentence, wasn't it? Yeah, sure, it's possible to eat more carbs. I mean, some people can eat 100 grams of carbs and be in ketosis. Some people have more energy output. Some people do explosive movements that require more glycogen and use up that glycogen quickly and allow them to enter ketosis quicker again. Lots of other stuff going on there. So, yeah, I answer your question with a question. Why do you think it's healthy to be obsessing over these things? And is that a healthy habit for you? What are you trying to do with your diet? Are you trying to lose body fat? Are you just trying to have more clear-headedness throughout the day? Mental clarity, better cognitive function, all those things? Is that what you want? Then what is it? What is the glucometer telling you? I don't know. And why are you eating all your carbs in one meal? Does that feel good to you? That's awesome? Like that make you perform better? Then it's all about context, right? Okay. Yes. All right. There you go. Paradoxical axiom says Chris Master John showed that ketones can be generated in most macro contexts. Goes to show that high ketones doesn't mean high weight loss slash health context. Absolutely. But it wasn't just this guy. What is his name? Chris Master John, PhD. All right. Man. I always laugh when people put like a title after their name, right? PhD. All right, whatever. So Chris Masterjohn, I'm sure he's a great guy. So he's a great doctor. But this dude didn't like invent or uh, discover magically that ketones don't equal fat loss. Everybody's known that. Yeah, you can generate ketones on a 100% carb diet depending on when you measure. Ketones in and of themselves do not mean more fat loss and they are not the goal of a ketogenic diet for fat loss. Yeah, you're going to produce ketones as a byproduct of that fat loss, but the goal is not the ketones. You can push your ketones up by wasting a bunch of money on multi-level marketed exogenous ketone products, but that's not going to make you burn more body fat. It might make you a little bit less hungry throughout the day. It might stave off that hunger a little bit and help you eat less, but you're still putting energy in that you need to burn. Daniel says, hi, Tristan, love the vids. You talk a lot about burning fat and getting fat macros for a body. Then can I eat only protein and greens? Why don't you get about 10 minutes? All right, look, can you eat only protein and greens? You could do that. It's called a protein sparing modified fast. You don't want to do that long term. You want some fat for energy. But what I'm always saying, I'm not always saying don't eat fat. What I'm saying is this, and I know it sounds absolutely weird wacky and wild if you've been listening to all the parrot puppets on the internet talking about the same crap that they're regurgitating from other people who don't know what they're talking about. It might sound crazy when I say that eating a bunch of fat is not going to make you lose a bunch of weight. It might sound totally crazy, but that's all I'm saying. Just like taste of those words. Eating a lot of fat will not make you lose a lot of weight. It just sounds right. <laughs> Faith Speed says, do you still take acetyl L-carnitine supplement? When did I talk about Alcar? Alcar can be a cool – I don't take that all the time. There's no like real supplement that I feel like I need to take, right? Like these things are fun to play with. You want to optimize performance and stuff like that, but I like to keep it simple. Uh, acetyl L-carnitine can be very beneficial for the liver and for mobilizing and burning fatty acids. Uh, do I take it every day? No. I get it for red meat though. There's plenty of carnitine in red meat. All right. Blue. What's up, Blue? Thank you for being who you are. I was on a high-carb, low-fat diet. My hormones were effed up. Now I switched to high-fat, low-carb, and I feel so good. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, Blue. Keep it up, man. Robert S. says, in ketosis, 
there should be a general formula for taking body fat percentage, lean muscle mass, and the amount of glucose the body creates daily via gluconeogenesis for the blood sugar stabilization, and then figuring out optimal ratios for fat, protein, or even carbs? Sure, dude, Robert S., tell me the, tell me the freaking, give me the calculator, man. Give me the magic formula. Give me the magic number, bro. Everybody wants like the magic macro calculator, but no, and then they realize that none of them work. There's no freaking magic calculator. It's about context. I don't know what your metabolic rate is. I don't know. You say how much lean muscle mass or blah, 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 how much glucose the body creates daily via gluconeogenesis for the brain and blood sugar stabilization. Your body can make gluco glucose out of both protein and fatty acids. How are you going to know which one it's making it out of? How, I don't know, man. Thank you for the comment. That's great. Like, it's cool. If you figure it out, private message me your magic formula. But I ain't got it. I look at it on an individual basis. Adam Franz says, I started eating fish every day to get the DHA per your recommendation. I feel mentally and physically amazing. That's awesome. Isn't it weird, right? A big meal of fish will leave you feeling so energized and so good. It's funny. And the fatty acids in fish are actually inhibitory for glycolysis. So DHA inhibits glycolytic enzymes, meaning DHA makes you not burn sugar. So DHA, therefore, may be very beneficial for promoting fat burning. Also, fish has got a lot of selenium and iodine, so it's great. I'm just I'm stoked that you're feeling better every day. I feel great when I eat fish every day. I didn't have fish yesterday or today, though. I still feel great. How amazing. You know, feeling great is not about what you eat. <laughs> it's not about what you avoid. Right? It's about what you fuel yourself with. What are you really feeding on? What are you really feeding on? It's not the food. I'm not talking about physical energy, Right? Hey, Tristan, new listener from a little beach town on the Washington State coast. Going to give my husband a kidney on the 20th. Wow. And keto adapted. An issue going into surgery. I should be converse about. Oh, wow, Rebecca. Rebecca, that is, that's so sweet. You're giving your husband a kidney. Man. I'm not a doctor, a medical professional. If you want medical professional advice, go to your medical professional, right? Uh, <laughs> here's what I'll say, Rebecca Lott. It's just something that comes to mind is Luis Villasenor's. Uh, lovely. Luis Villasenor is, he runs the Keto Gains group on Facebook. He runs ketogains.com and the Keto Gains Reddit forum. Uh, Luis has been doing keto for like 16 years. His lovely fiance, Marisol, is a plastic surgeon. She's been utilizing a ketogenic diet in her clients, in her, or what do you call them, patients for a few years now. And she finds that they recover quicker, they have less inflammation, and they do much better with surgery in general. That's what she says. Pretty cool, right? So, hey, you might be, pr you might be primed for this. And that is, that's just amazing. You're giving a kidney to your husband. That's wild. The fact that we can take a kidney out and put it in another person's body – and like, what do you need the same blood type, right? Did you know your blood type when he married you? <laughs> Did he marry a donor on purpose? That's crazy. That's so sweet. Rebecca, hey, good luck. Best of wishes to you. What a blessing to give your husband. You must really love him. That's inspiring. So um, that's awesome. All right. Cat C says, haha, I love your response. I forget what I responded to, though. <laughs> Um, okay. Let's see. I'm getting all lost in the comments. There's so many questions. There's so many comments. Man, thanks to everybody for joining. All right, let's see. Where's another one? Dustin says, good to be here. The Big Moist says, just want to say thanks for all the vids. Help me and my wife a lot with our keto diet. Love the cookbook. Fountain of Knowledge fountain of knowledge. Wow. That is quite the compliment. Thank you. That's what we wanted it to be, man. I mean, we spent months editing it and just making sure that we gave as much valuable knowledge in there as possible. So thanks for, thanks. It's awesome. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. 
Man, so many. All right. All right, scrolling down. Found it. Sarah says your stalkers will find you. <laughs> if I do more videos, I'm like, I don't have stalkers. Good luck to any stalkers who want to stalk me. I'm crazy. Sarah says you did the food market video. I did. Notice in that video I didn't say the name of the town I even live in, though. Susan Price says you're the keto don of the Ecuador Andes. That's funny. The keto don. I was just hanging out with my buddy Don in the Ecuador Andes. Don. VLN from Scotland. What's up, man? Scotland, that's awesome. Love your approach. Me and the husband have been keto since our daughter was born. We do it because it's the right thing for us. It makes, makes us healthy and sharp. That's what's up. It's the right thing for you. That's why you do it. That's so cool. Awesome. All right, Sarah Leland says, I don't want another town location. Just intrigued what's available. I'll, all right, I'll do some more day in the life type. Like, I'll do some more videos. It's like, whatever. It's not like I own this town. I really do. No, <laughs> um, yeah, no, you can't. Can't close it off. I have the population control wing of Phil Cabamba, Ecuador. Uh oh. Uh oh, I said it. I said where I live. Dalen, the child, is now blocked. These children come on here. Who gives these children keyboards? Pathetic. All right. Fly Trap Factory. What's up, man? In England. Matthew Whitfield in England. How's it going? Oh, Fly Trap Factory is from New Zealand. 8.57 a.m. That's crazy. Good morning to the New Zealanders. Have you ever heard of anyone having an allergic reaction? Allergic reaction to what? What are you talking about, Kate? All right. Paradoxical actions taken off. Going to go eat lamb, avocado, and Jessica's bone broth super elixir. That is so rad. Paradoxical action. See you later. I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining. Maybe one day I'll learn your real name. <laughs> Gregor Bender. Gregor Clegane. No, Gregor Bander says, I've been on keto for a few months now, and I went from 265 to 225. That's awesome. Thanks for your inspiration. Been loving your maca. I didn't realize it would taste that good. Why? You like the taste? I like the taste, too. I love the taste of maca. And I've had a lot of people say they didn't realize our maca would taste so good. By the way, we don't have any more maca. I'm sorry, to everybody, if you, you, know, if you want maca. We don't have any right now. But we will have it in the future. Um, some people hate the taste. I'm glad you like it. I love the taste. Gregor says, I've tried a few two-day fasts. I'm thinking about doing a three- or four-day. Do you have any thoughts about MCT during a longer fast? All right. A fast is when you don't eat anything. If you're eating MCT oil, you're not fasting. If you're eating protein, you're not fasting. If you're drinking butter tea or butter coffee, bulletproof coffee, you're not fasting. So fasting is not eating any calories. I hope that helps. Okay. Thomas in Greece. What's up, Thomas? Thomas is over there in Greece. Man, you guys are having a heck of a time in Greece right now, aren't you? All right. Greece. Where'd you go, Thomas? I lost you. Where'd your question go? Okay. Opinion on cyclical ketogenic diet for increasing lean muscle gains. Six-day keto, one-day carbs. Done my homework. Seems okay, and I'm testing now. And a uh, master in science nutrition student. What's up, Thomas? All right, Thomas, in my opinion, that cyclical ketogenic diet crap is crap. Uh, look, if you're looking to maximize lean muscle building and you want to use carbs, try this. Try this. Here's a real cyclical ketogenic diet. Not all these jack offs who are telling you to do six days of no carb and one day of carb are keeping you in this stupid cycle of these refeeds and obsessing over the carbs. It's not beneficial to lead muscle mass growth. It usually ends up in more fat mass gain. And people have a lot of trouble maintaining a steady intake of energy on these refeed days. You know, they have their refeed days or their carb night or whatever. It's it's always it's always marketed to like the lowest common denominator of the human like psyche, right? The part of the mind that wants to get results but not really make long-term changes and like not really I can eat junk food and still get the results. That's what these diets appeal to, right? Carb night. You put a freaking picture of a donut on your fat loss book. This is a joke, right? Like you're not trying to market success if you're putting donut pictures in your freaking fat loss book. Um, all 
weird comments. All right, so here's uh, here's what I'll say. You want to do a cyclical style ketogenic diet? Do it this way. You're looking to gain body mass, gain muscle, and you want to use carbs. Eat carbs. Eat more carbs. Don't try and stay in keto six days a week. Do like four weeks of a carbohydrate-driven diet where you're getting sufficient fats but also bumping those carbs up around training, uh, increasing your carbohydrate, your caloric intake, maximizing um, you know, the intensity, the volume of your training without overtraining. That's going to be more helpful than doing like six days keto, one day no keto. That is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for weird relationships with food. I don't like it. I never use a cyclical ketogenic diet with any of my clients. What I do, though, for people who are trying to use carbohydrates and who want to use more carbohydrates, here's what I say. Do keto for six weeks, then do carbs for two weeks and cycle it like that. Try it out. Try it. Two weeks carbs, four, four to six weeks keto. Try that. Much better, much less of a roller coaster of emotion and rah, 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 cravings and all that. When you're doing keto, do keto. When you're eating carbs, eat the carbs. Human beings aren't entirely quantifiable. Yeah, they're not quantifiable at all. All right. Vicious Nutritious says, we share 98% DNA with chimps and gorillas. Your thoughts on modeling a diet based on what they eat? This is such a stupid dogma. Chimps and gorillas. All right, so chimps eat monkeys. Chimps kill and cannibalize. No, not, not all chimps, but chimps eat monkeys. Chimps eat bugs. Chimps eat meat. There's no vegan monk. They're, chimps aren't vegan. <laughs> so there's one thing. First of all, I don't care if you share 98% of your DNA with chimps. You share 90-something 90, 90 percent of your DNA with dogs and cats too. DNA is just this one little thing. It's this one little lens through which you're looking at this. I don't know. I'm not vicious, nutritious. Go ask a vegan that question, and then you can hear some bullshit lame response. I'm not even going to answer it. Sorry. Not saying like not to say that that's what you're trying to do is bait me into some dumb vegan game, but uh, – yeah, I mean, my thoughts on modeling a diet based on plants, fruits, figs, and shoots. Go do it. See what happens. My thoughts, I don't have any thoughts on it. I don't do that. I've done a vegan diet. It was highly destructive. I've seen people completely ravaged and wrecked by these vegan diets. You want to go eat like a monkey? Go eat like a monkey. Hey, you can have social hierarchy and sexual hierarchy like chimps too. Go do that. Yeah. It's a great idea, right? You say you share 98% of your DNA. You're just a freaking monkey, right? Go live in a social hierarchy that's regulated like chimps or bonobos. Gorillas. Freaking vegan dogmas and shit. All right. Anthony says, just came down with nasty gastro lasted a week. Starting the recovery process. Should I maybe pause keto until recovered? Man, I don't know. You having gut health issues, and I don't know. <laughs> there could be a hundred different things going on with those gut issues, right? Like you could have a you could have a lack of bacteria. You could have an overgrowth of bacteria. I don't know what's going on there. The gut is the next frontier in the health sciences. Very, very interesting. Look at some of the research on the gut microbiome, circadian rhythms of the gut microbiome. There's so much fascinating research being done on this. Um, sorry, I don't have any quick answer for you, um, but I hope you get better and I hope you feel better. I'd say just keep doing what you're doing, man. Get nutrient-dense whole foods in. Um, replenish that gut flora. Maybe some fermented vegetables if you're into it. All right. Ryan Backus. What's up, Ryan? Question about adaptation. Every time I start keto, after about three or two or three days, I start doing mental gymnastics to convince myself I need a high carb day. But I can't control these thoughts. Why is this? This is so cool. I wish I saw this question right after the cyclical ketogenic diet. So, Ryan, I'm going to double this up with the previous question that I expanded on and, uh, and try to attack these both because they they interplay, they intertwine. What's going on here is like two to three days in, your glycogen stores are getting depleted. And you're used to burning glycogen. You're used to burning glucose as your primary source of fuel your whole life. You've been doing it. Then it's gone. The glucose is gone. Your body wants it. 
it gets a little bit stressed out when you try to switch fuel sources. So what I would say, the best thing to do is make sure you're getting in sufficient fats. Don't worry about creating a huge deficit in the beginning. Eat it around maintenance calories. Get those maintenance calories from the fats. Of course, get sufficient protein. The rest of the calories will be made up by fat. Carbohydrates around 30 grams net carb. Push through those two to three days. After you get past like five, seven days, the craving should stop. Once you start creating enough ketones, once your body gets used to using those ketones, which takes time, you know, your body has to generate new mitochondria to actually burn these ketones, to actually utilize the fatty acids for, for fuel. So when you get through that, your hunger is going to drop. You're going to feel much better. You're going to get through the eye of the storm. But those two to three days, like two days in, that's the hardest for most people. Make sure you're getting enough electrolytes. Sodium's the easiest. Five to seven grams of sodium. I usually have clients supplement with about 400 milligrams of magnesium glycinate one to two times daily. And then make sure you're getting enough potassium from dietary sources like uh, uh, sorry, avocados, um, pumpkin seeds, spinach. Those are all great sources. Also, salmon's a pretty good source of potassium. So get the potassium in. And you'll be fine. Give it time. Now, let's tie this in with the other question about cyclical ketogenic diets. You know that state when you're in between the metabolisms, two days in when your glycogen's depleted, your body's kind of in between, you're in that metabolic limbo state where you're not quite adapted to ketosis or used to it or enjoying it, but you're on the outskirts of it, your body's thinking about it, and you don't have enough carbs to fuel you for energy. That limbo state can be hellish. You have no energy, you might have no mental clarity, you might feel crappy. Now imagine going five days and you just start to come out of that state. You just start to kind of get adapted. You start to feel a little bit more good, a little bit more clear-headed, more steady energy, stable blood sugar throughout the day. Then day six, you've been told that you got to have your carb day. You need your carbs. And you get those carbs, you eat them, you pig out on them, and it starts the whole cycle over again. Three days in, you feel crappy again. Your mind starts telling you, just have some carbs, man. Like this diet sucks. Like you're not feeling good. You're not burning fat. You need those carbs. You want carbs. You need them. And your mind keeps going, going, going. And then it justifies it. And then you end up, you know, doing it all over again. That's what cyclical ketogenic diets tend to promote in a lot of people. I mean, I can't tell you how many clients I've had who are coming off of a cyclical ketogenic diet that didn't work for them, that they hated. And then they get on a straight keto diet and they even could cycle in and out of ketosis doing like we talked about earlier, doing like four, six months on keto and then like two months on carbs. This could work really, really well, especially for athletes who want to bulk up, gain a little lean muscle mass or the other way around. So yeah, there you go. Ryan Backus says, awesome, that makes sense. As a bodybuilding, I usually do high carb, but I couldn't figure out why I get aches and crazy carb thoughts so soon. Yeah, man, look, when you deplete the glycogen and you don't have anywhere else to go, that's where you go. Your body's just like, feed me, fill me up. Um, I suggest going one way or the other. Eat enough carbs to fuel you or restrict them enough to fuel with ketones. That's where I like to be. I don't like that limbo state. I don't like to dabble around the refeeds and all that. If I'm doing keto, I'm doing keto. If I'm eating carbs, I don't eat as many carbs as I used to think I needed. Um, but I eat them. And I eat less fat when I eat more carbs. So that's how I would suggest you look into doing it. Clay Bigsby, what's up, man? Daniel Jeff, what's up? Daniel Leff, rather. Sorry. Getting late here in the Middle East. Say hi to Jessica. All right, Daniel. Have a good night, man. Robert S. The challenge with six weeks, then two weeks carbs is getting back into ketosis, which sucks, says Robert. So I just stay in ketosis much easier. Hey, that's all about context though, man. Look, if you've been doing a ketogenic diet for like years, you might be surprised that a small amount of carbohydrate, first of all, you use carbs much more effectively if you do eat carbohydrates, but also you switch back into keto rather easily. I mean, I find that when I go, if I go, I usually do. If I'm going to eat carbs, I can usually last like two weeks eating carbs. And then I get back on keto again. I think the longest I've gone the last like four, four years, three years, I don't know. The longest I've gone at least the last three years would be like maybe eight weeks of eating carbs it, straight. And then I, it was kind of a struggle at the end. I like keto. I like how my body feels. I crave fatty, salty foods. Uh, 
And all my habits now have been switched over to keto habits. So it's like if I'm busy, if I'm working, if I'm having fun, and it's like suddenly, okay, I should probably eat something. All my habits now have been ketofied. You know what I'm saying? So it's like my go-to foods. I'm going to eat something. Where's an avocado? Yeah, I'm going to take an avocado, a little bit of goat yogurt, mix up, make a nice sauce, have some sardines, have some meatballs, something like that. Those are my go-to quick meals, keto style. So it's like that's – why it's easy for me to maintain ketosis. But like you said, uh, you said, you know, six weeks. What did you say? You said you think that six weeks. I think it's better to go like months. Like so go four to six months on keto, then do like two months on carbs. I don't know. But it all depends on context. I'm talking about one specific context here. Other contexts require different approaches. So anyways, yeah. Clay Bigsby says, thank you so much for your videos. Went from 2.30 mid-February to 195 today on keto. Whew, so much great information on this channel. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Clay. That's awesome, man. Wait. All right. Kevin on Earth says, Tristan, how do I figure out my lean muscle mass to calculate my protein intake per meal? Lean muscle mass, take your total weight minus your fat mass. Meaning you'll probably have to estimate your body fat percentage and take that off. And that will be your lean body mass, which will also include your bone mass. <laughs> Robert S. says, yeah, Keto Habits, good book title. <laughs> keto Habits? It's all about those Keto Habits. I got a bad Keto Habit. I got a bad Keto Habit. <laughs> all right. Kevin on Earth, what's up? Jack Diamond, how's it going? Jack says, how much potassium do you need? I think the recommended daily intake is something like a couple grams, like two grams per day, which can be hard to get supplementary. So you got to eat foods, man. Avocado's got about a gram of potassium per serving, I think. Um, look that up, cross-check it. Um, Avocado is probably my favorite source of potassium. When I'm doing keto... I try to get at least one or two avocados in every single day. Sarah Mazur says, the most accurate is DEXA scan. There are calculators. Yeah, so look, you visually estimate your body fat percentage or you can use a caliper and then just you subtract that for your total weight. You don't need to do a DEXA scan or radiate yourself or anything like that. It should be good. Ryan Backus says, the problem is that people misinterpret the literature on CKD. Absolutely. People misinterpret the literature on everything, right? Everything. Most primary author on it, like Lyle McDonald, recommend at least three to four weeks of straight keto before refeeding. Yes. Thank you. Exactly, man. People want to hear what they want to hear. People want the easy route. People want to be – people look for marketing that just tells them, hey, you don't have to change yourself. Lose weight. Eat Pop-Tarts. If it fits your mouth diet, if it fits your microwave diet, if it fits your macros. All right, here we go. Kevin says, I have chronic inflammation resulting in eczema. Any tips on getting rid of eczema while on keto? Well, what's creating the chronic inflammation? That's the first question. Why are you chronically inflamed and where is this allergic reaction coming from? It's probably something environmental. It's probably compounded environmental factors that can include diet, stress, right? Like even just like straight up emotional stress, just, just emotional stress. That can cause breakouts, um, you know, depressed immune system response, stuff like that. You could also have a bacterial imbalance. I'm not trying to freak you out. I'm going to send you like Google doctor and everything. I'd say – because I actually care about my audience, right? Like I, people will sit here and oh, you're going to do that. You probably got candida. You're going to look into that. I freak you out about this. Freak you out about that. You know, I'm not going to try to send you on this Google doctor rabbit hole. Stay out of that crap. Um, reduce your stress. Improve your circadian rhythm and your sleep. Get outside in nature more. Stay away. Don't do what I'm doing right now. I'm sitting here talking to a computer. But I just got in from outside. See how red I am. You see that? <laughs> sun, sun toasted me today. But get, get outside in nature. Get some sunlight on you. Go swim in natural bodies of water. Enjoy life. Reduce stress. Start there. You know, I mean, everybody's like diet, candida, this and that. Rah, rah, rah. It's just more stressors sometimes. Breathe deep. <sighs> Breathe deep. Enjoy life. Reduce stress. Take it one step at a time. 
If you got a bacterial imbalance, take that one step at a time. Don't just destroy yourself trying to detox, detox, detox. You got to detox. You got to, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't make the mistakes that me and other people have made in the past when you're trying to get healthy. Don't blast your body so quickly. Take it one step at a time. Things like eczema, long-standing allergies and stuff like that, take time to amend. It takes time to fix. You know, I still get stuff, you know, seasonally. Listen to it right now. It's pretty stuffed up. You know, I mean, t two days ago, it was super stuffed up. The body is in constant flux with the environment around it. It's in constant reaction to the environment, trying to find balance and homeostasis within dynamic environmental changes that are in constant flux. So, um, yeah, look at your environment, your social environment too, right? That can create a lot of stress. If you're just around people that are super negative all the time, around people that are full of negative thought forms, that are speaking ill of people, that are, you know, I mean, this this will affect you. So, yeah, try to re reduce that inflammation. Start with sleep, light exposure. Expose yourself to natural light during the day. Get rid of the artificial light at night. Turn the TV off. Quit listening to the news and reading the propaganda. The, do people even read newspapers anymore? Right, like they're all online now, right? Like the fake New York Times and Washington Post and Wall Street Journal, all these propaganda outlets. They're like, you don't even read those in paper anymore, do you? But anyways, quit reading the propaganda. Quit reading this crap that suppresses your immune system and makes you feel weak and powerless. And quit speaking things that make you feel weak and powerless. Right? Do things that make you feel empowered, that make you feel strong, that make you feel full of life, that make you feel like you have something to give. Right? Quit focusing on the stress. Flytrap says, it's following your advice. Smashed 15 kilos in 16 weeks. Vision improved. Clarity improved. Stronger and quicker recovery at gym. Joint pain gone. 40 years old, best physical state of my life. Flytrap Factory, thank you for the comment. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome, man. Wow. I love it. Thank you, man. Like really, like I don't even know what to say. Like that makes I'm all like choked up and like teary eyed now. Like really, it doesn't right, stop. Not an emotional response, but like that's that's so cool. Thank you. Thanks for everybody who watches. Thanks for everybody who finds value in this. I appreciate it. You know, I mean, this it takes energy, it takes time, uh, and it takes passion, and we love what we do. So thank you so much. All right. Ditka says RDA of potassium 4,700 milligrams. There you go. So that's like almost five grams. Yeah. Um, my favorite sources of potassium, I like spinach, avocado, pumpkin seeds are good. Actually, salmon's a pretty good source of potassium too. And uh, sardines have a decent amount as well. Dustin says swore off Facebook. Yeah, get off of Facebook, right? <sighs> the cesspool that is Facebook. I mean, come on. Like, human interactions have been wrecked. Facebook is terrible. We have a Facebook page for our, uh, like, business page. But even there, man, like, the things people will post and say on Facebook. I mean, these are toxic areas. Vacate the toxic zones. Extricate yourself from the BS, from the falseness, and live. Just be you. We don't know. You know, yeah, be me. I don't even know who I am. That's like the first thing, right? It takes time to figure out who we are. It's not even like you ever really figure it out. We just, it's like we drop these layers and we relax into being who we are and what we are. Um, so, yeah, man, if you're trying to reduce your inflammation, get in touch with yourself. Breathe deep, enjoy life, do things you love. Flytrap Factory, thanks for the comments, man. I'm going to start wrapping this up, everybody. Dustin Mitchell says, thank you too, Tristan. Definitely going to keep up with your videos. Thank you, man. Dustin, uh, Robert S., thanks for the hangout, Tristan. Time to go eat a box of donuts for my carb refeed. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Stephanie Nash, what's up? Deleted, not deactivated. Just live. <laughs> Delete it. Delete your Facebook. There you go. The delete your Facebook challenge starts now. Delete your Facebook. Quit pretending these are your friends on Facebook. Your friends are the people that you look in the eye and you feel their energy. You feel their presence. You know they're down for you. That's your friends. These people on Facebook who like your shit because they're bored sitting around at work when they're not supposed to be working. 
All right. Phil Hooper says, hi from UK. 100 pounds down so far. Congratulations, man. 100 pounds lost. Um, I'm going to start wrapping this up. Unless anybody's got some more questions that are screaming out at me to be answered. Um, I want to thank you all for joining. Uh, man, I mean, I go a thousand different directions with uh, – with what I want to do with this channel sometimes. I really, I'm thinking about expanding it in different ways or just starting another channel that's more broad because I feel like people come here and they expect just like diet, fitness. Fitness, that's the most annoying word now. YouTube fitness is such so obnoxious. Fitness industry in general, right? Um, but I like, I want to expand. That's why I didn't name this like ketogenic edge health or, you know, paleo health. Like this, I call this channel Primal Edge Health. I like the word primal. I like getting to the essence of things. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't lock in the name of this channel to anything in specific. You know, we're about healthy living. It was a lifestyle channel. And I, I don't know, I'm thinking about expanding it in that way and getting into more of the travel stuff, but I've got to reassess. Maybe I should do a different channel for that. Um, so what do you think, you guys? Different channel for like lifestyle stuff, traveling, South America adventure, ancient mysteries, exploration, cave dwellings, and uh, shoot, the the blazer build, the, the truck build, stuff like that. Should I do that on another channel or should I just do it here? I don't know. Comment. Let me know. Chill Topher says, start keto coach programs. Yeah, I do coaching, man. I do coaching. I don't, I don't want to do like a program where I don't like cut and dry cookie cutter stuff though, man. That's a thing chill Topher. when i work with clients i like to talk to people i like to actually like really talk to them you know look at their situation not just throw out you know the same plans at everybody like i see coaches doing i love doing the coaching but i i wouldn't want to do something that's too uh that's not personal right i like the personal aspect of it Retreats might be something on the line. Phil Hooper says a K5 is looking good. Thank you. It's looking all right. Feels all right. I feel it drives better than it looks. <laughs> um, Phil Hooper, just for you. Phil Hooper, just for you. All right, so the last month, here's what's been done to the K5 Blazer. I've got a 1982 Blazer that's been, it's been, it's been destroyed over the last like five years. I didn't take very good care of it. Um, it was the lowest priority was like maintaining this vehicle. And I just thought I was going to drive it into the ground, but it's such a good car. It's such a classic. They're such beautiful trucks. I love these old Chevys. Um, I decided to finally fix it up. Uh, it's finally put some energy into it. And in classic me, uh, fashion, I kind of like dove into it pretty intensely. Uh, so the past few months, I've been doing a lot of work. I completely, I changed all the body mounts. So every single piece of rubber underneath that truck has been changed now. So brand new energy suspension, polyurethane body mounts, motor mounts, and transmission mounts, which is that, that changed the way the car feels. Like you start it up, and the way that the vibration from the engine goes through those poly mounts, is, you feel it. It's so cool. Um, what else did I do? I changed the sway bar bushings. I changed – what else did I change? I changed the sway bar bushings, changed the tie rods. Uh, this, I put a new Borgerson steering shaft in, so I eliminated the rag joint. I put, I did a lot of stuff last few months. It was crazy work. Um, what else? Oh, I did the rear differential. I put, I changed the gearing, the rear differential, changed all the suspension, put new leaf springs and shocks. Nothing special, just leaf springs and shocks and uh, and tires on it. <clears throat> and then changed the rear differential because I changed the tire size. The, and I always wanted to change the rear diff. I want to see what it was like in there put was it uh, 4.1 to 1 gear ratio in there and also or 41 to 1 gear ratio and also put a uh, a locker i put a locker in the rear end and i'm so stoked on it uh, so i've got a power tracks in the, in the rear that's what i've done in the last few months next is doing the engine and the interior and exterior and all that the engine's fun all the pains and the body work and all that stuff sucks i'm not looking forward to that so yeah Thanks for the comment, Phil. It is looking good. It is driving dang good. It just needs a little bit more más fuerza. Necesita más fuerza. It's got a 305 in it, and I'm going to put a 350 in it. Put some heads on it. Just like a full-built 350. Not like nothing crazy, like a, like mellow, nothing nothing extreme. 
really mild can and stuff like that. So that'll be fun. All right. Steep gears. Yeah, but they're 33-inch tires, Dustin. They're, 30, they're 33s. So it's not steep for 33s, really. It actually feels about like it did on 31s with stock gearing, which is like 3.7. 3.73 or whatever. I don't even know. It's fun. It's really fun learning about all this stuff. Dustin Mitchell and Phil Hooper. 305 is a bit anemic. Yes, exactly. Well, I, dude, I went back and forth for so long. I was like, well, why would I get rid of this? The 305 runs great. It's not burning much oil. Yeah, compared to the 350. It's like it's a good engine. It's torquey and it gets me point A to point B, but it doesn't have – it just doesn't – it doesn't have the same – potentia you know i need yeah it's a 4400 pound vehicle and it's going through the andes all the time so it's like steep inclines lots of off-road driving and uh i think it just i just want it faster you know i want to be able to pass a bus on the road whip it around the two lane highways everywhere you, you, i want a little bit of oomph there and it's not enough with this 305 you know i need 400 horsepower <laughs> I want torquey, low end, bottom end is important. I don't care what it does. I'm never gonna, I never get above like 4,000 RPM anyways, unless I'm playing around. So yeah, that's it. I'll stop talking about it. It doesn't make sense to anybody here. I'm going to wrap up. I just talked about cars when I shouldn't have. Thank you. Oh, Epp says, do you block people from your chats? Yes, I do block people. People come, people start some shit, people start trying to battle, then I will block them. EPP1273, would you like to be blocked? <laughs> All right. Let's see. Let's answer a couple more questions. Kidney stones on the keto diet. I've heard that it becomes more common on the keto diet, but water can prevent it. All right, so when they first did research into the ketogenic diet in the 1920s and 30s, one of the major complications that they could run into occasionally in these children with epilepsy were kidney stones. Now, this could be remediated simply by giving them potassium citrate daily. So potassium levels and electrolyte levels are crucial for kidney function if you're dehydrating yourself kidney stones can become an issue on whatever diet you're on all right that's it guys i think i'm i think i'm gonna wrap it up i think we're done here um i want to thank everybody for asking questions so many great questions here so much i don't know it's fun talking to you guys i enjoy it um and thanks for everybody. The, the real motivation, like when people put these comments and they say, oh, you know, you helped me do this or that, I I get so, I get really like, I don't know. I don't even know how to explain it. I get all sentimental. Like it may, it's not like I want my, I don't want my, my horn tooted because I'm nothing, man. Like I'm just like, a, I'm just a guy. I'm just a, a guy in a flesh vessel that lives in the Andes doing whatever. Like I'm, I'm a human. You know, I really... To me, the most, it's just so profound that like we can positively affect other people, you know, and reach out and actually maybe help people a little bit. I get it all sappy when I think about it. So thanks to everybody for posting these positive comments and, um, you know, for, for helping out. So this helps to motivate me when I get this positive feedback, when I know that I'm actually making a difference and when I feel I'm actually making a difference, it makes me feel great. <laughs> you know, it makes me feel like this is all worth it. So, um, Again, thank you for joining. Thank you for the kind words, for the motivation, for the inspiration, all of you. I mean, we've got people coming in here. Every time I do this, someone new comes up and it's like, dude, I lost 100 pounds on a ketogenic diet or I lost 75 pounds in the last year listening to your advice. I think it's amazing. Like people I've never even met could actually, you know, the, the, the stuff that I say could actually affect them positively. So I think it's fantastic. And I like it. So... I like doing these live hangouts. I'm going to do more of them. Thanks for joining, everybody. You can find more content at primaledgehealth.com. Uh, if you like these live hangouts and you want to be informed beforehand, make sure to sign up for uh, for our newsletter at primaledgehealth.com. We don't spam you with the newsletter. I'm not all about that. I don't send you stupid, you got to check this new product out every day. Nothing like that. What I like to do is just announce to our audience when we're going to do these so that everybody can join in. Join the party, ask questions, leave comments, whatever you want to do. So yeah, go to primaledgehealth.com. You can join the Hangouts in the future. And um, if you like the content, you want to support us. And 
You want to get the hands down the best keto resource book that you can find. The Ketogenic Edge Cookbook is available exclusively at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Thank you to everybody for leaving reviews. Please leave a review on the book if you bought it and you like it. Um, yeah, so yeah, like this, share it, do all the things I'm supposed to tell you to do. And uh, just enjoy life. You know, if there's one thing you take out of this, it's not about what you eat. It's not about the food you put in your body. It's about what fuels you. It's about what sparks you. And what you fuel the world around you, right? It's like our... I'll leave it at that. It's not about the food you feed on. It's about what you actually feed on, what actually fuels you. So I'll see you guys next time. PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Thanks for joining. Peace out, YouTube.